Coming up on Unscripted Faith, from navigating relationships to offering advice on topics such as faith and health, we've got you covered. We have a guest who has some proven tips to help you live a life of purpose and joy. And think about this, what, are you, what would you do if your child, you found out your child had cancer? I mean, that's a very serious thing right there. You're going to hear one woman serve how she chose faith over fear and how God is at the center of it all. Stay tuned. Unscripted Faith starts right now. Welcome to Unscripted Faith. We are going to cover it all today, so I hope you got your seat belts fastened and ready to roll, right, Jay? I'm ready. I'm <laughs> buckled in. I'm ready to blast off. It's going to be great. Yes. Got some great ladies on the show today. Yes. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to get into it. Listen, our next guest has made it her mission to help lives shine brighter than ever, because after all, we only get one life to live. Jesse, we're excited to have you on Unscripted Faith. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. We love having you. Now, listen, you you deal a lot with teens and young adults. And what really started your passion and drive towards that? Well, I actually was working at a Christian camp many years ago. It's been almost 20 years now. And I did seminars for these girls. And afterward, they started sending me emails asking questions. Um, and my husband had an idea. He's like, you know, I heard about this new thing called a blog. Maybe we should start one <laughs> so that you could post the answers to these questions. And that now almost 20 years later, lifeloveandgod.com, I get questions from girls all over the world. And they're able to ask the things that they're really struggling struggling with because they can ask anonymously. Um, so it helps me kind of keep my finger on the pulse of what young people are dealing with today. You know, being here in Christian television, uh, we see a lot of people calling in for healings, things along there. There are top like two or three. Mm -hmm. What are the top things that you're seeing that college age girls are, in, uh, are inquiring about and want to know more about? Well, you might be surprised, but the number one topic is still boys. <laughs> it's been that, way. Wow. been that way for almost 20 years. What, what, there's, what, I think there's core what, questions that we're asking as, as women and, and as young women that don't change over time. One of them is, is there a guy who would, who would like me, who would, who would pursue me? Mm -hmm. um, I also get a lot of questions about secret sins and addictions, about eating disorders and sexual mm -hmm. addiction, substance abuse. I'm wondering you know, I, I love Jesus. I want to get rid of this. How, how do I do this? And um, how do I get rid of the shame uh, that the enemy has just used to beat down these girls? Um, and then I would say the third is just, you know, we live in a time when adults are a little bit panicked about the culture, just a little bit. <laughs> There's some hard things going on, but these girls are growing up and that's the, it's the water that they're swimming in. And so they want to know, is there hope for them? Is there hope for their generation to live full and vibrant lives? And that's where this new book comes in. Well, you know, we just came through the election as well. I was yeah. curious, did you get a lot of questions that regards your election? And I'd be curious to know what were the ladies, what were the questions? Cause you know, men are different. You know, we're going to ask different questions than ladies are. What were the ladies' questions on the election if you were getting those? You know, I didn't get a lot of questions specifically about the election. I think okay. there was just a general feeling of um, just unease or dread, like just an unease. But I feel like it mostly was coming from the top down. They're, they're hearing a lot of the adults in their lives kind of losing their minds about <laughs> it all. And so, yeah, just figuring out how, how do we manage... Um, the anxiety that, that was manifesting in this at this time, sort of secondhand from their parents and grandparents and teachers. <laughs> Over the past 20 years of doing this, of course, there's a consistent theme of some of the same topics that they're, they have questions about. But have you seen a shift in mindsets or anything else that is kind of undergirding this generation? Yeah, that's one of the things I think it is most surprising as I as I travel and speak to young people I'll often ask, what's the hardest part of being a teen today? And that I've seen shift to where now the number one answer that I get is pressure, so wow. much pressure. And I think with the advent of, you know, the technology in their pockets, there's an added layer of pressure for girls to look a certain way, to be connected to everyone all the time, to kind of curate this look, 
and also to be on top of their schoolwork and sports and all of the things that they've got going on. Um, so I think the questions and, and that, that need to be connected has always been there, but technology has definitely shifted it to more, they're just feeling so much pressure. Well, you picked teenage and college age girls. Why that demographic? What what kind of stood out to you? They said, uh, is it just a personal calling? Was it something that you saw? What was it? Yeah, well, I've been working in this space for a long time, but I think the reason I've stayed in this space is because I'm a hopeless optimist. And I really do believe that if this is a time of life in your teens and early 20s, that you are making some of the biggest decisions that will set the course for your life. And so if we can give girls the tools at that age to think through why they're doing the things that they're doing, what they genuinely want most in life, and how to incorporate their faith into those decisions, then we can help set them on a course that will hopefully lead a bright life for the rest of their life. I love that age. <laughs> yes. I mean, I feel like those are some of the greatest years, yeah. right? You're living it up on oh, college wow. campus. You've got all these like-minded, like-aged people around you. Boy, it's boy, Independence, boys. boys. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of the fun. <laughs> um, what would you say are some kind of guide rails, one or two guide rails that if you could for every girl in this world to get a hold of, what are those two things? Oh. That's a great question. And I will tell you, so I started this before I was even a parent and now I have two teen girls of my own. And so it's definitely changed the dynamic of, of how I approach all of this. I'm really passionate about it now to help give girls these tools. And I'll tell you the two things I want most for my girls and, and by extension, all the girls I work with is that one, they'll know that they're loved and two, they'll know where to find Jesus. And everything else, the mistakes that they make, the, you know, the zips and zags in life, God it always has surprises for us. We all go through things because of other people's sins against us. We all go through hardship. But if they know that they're loved and they know where to find Jesus, I know they're going to be okay. You know, follow up with that. You know, you talked about you want your daughters to know that they're loved. Here's my little, I'm going to throw a little curveball at you right now. Uh, what do you think is the most important relationship in a young girl's life? Mm. Mm. To know that they're loved and understand that yeah, they're loved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I want to say the relationship with her dad is huge. That is, that is a very important one. Um, but not every family has two parents in the home. And I've seen that at least having one parent who is there and engaged and has genuine relationship with her is still the most important. It's important to have friends. It's important to have, you know, the the relationships, even romantic relationships as she gets older, but the relationship with parents is still top. Mm. You know, that relationship with parents, it really does shape our idea of God. So I think yes. that, you know, how we view our father yes. or the oh, lack wow. or his, you know, his presence or his lack ultimately Im imparts in us who we believe God to be. With, with the few minutes that we have left, Jesse, what is something that you feel that this generation is uniquely grappling with? Of course, we talked a little bit about the two issues kind of that are surfacing with them, but what is a unique grappling for this generation and how do they apply the word of God to overcome it? Oh, that's a great, great question. Wow. I, I think we're hearing a lot about this now, and I'm so grateful. There's so many studies coming out talking about technology with teens, but I see, I see a new wave of teens who are grappling with how to set healthy boundaries themselves on their technology. Wow. They're starting to understand the effect that it's having on them. They talk about brain rot, how they're just, you know, vegging out brain rot YouTube after school, yeah. and they're recognizing that that's not necessarily healthy. It's not necessarily the way they want the, their lives to go. They're seeing the effects of that technology on their parents and understanding that's not necessarily, they don't want to always be tied to their phone, even around the, around the table. Um, so I see them wrestling with it. I don't know that they necessarily have all the tools yet, but I'm hopeful that they're at least asking the questions. Um, that's my, my big thing is if we at least ask why, and we don't stop looking for answers, eventually we'll find them because, because God provides answers in his word for everything in life, including technology. So believe it or not, <laughs> how we use our time. 
Well, you know what's amazing? I'm a Generation X guy. We grew up in the video game era, but when I got into my 20s, my early 20s, that's when the whole media piece came out. So, like, I didn't get a chance to grow up in With that, it. but my kids are growing up in it. Yeah. Do you have certain things that you set apart for your family to kind of help put some boundaries around that? What would you recommend, doctor? <laughs> yeah, okay, well, disclaimer. <laughs> We're the first generation of parents who are having to set up these boundaries for our kids. So I will. I can share some things that I've done after watching teens grow up in this, but um, I do not claim to be an expert in this. Andy Crouch has done a great job. He's got some books on technology that have helped my family keeping tech in its proper place. So we definitely have bedtimes for everyone's phones in our family. We have screen times for our girls that they actually have helped. I've, it's a discussion of what do you think is a healthy amount of time on YouTube per day? Then let's set a screen time limit for that. Um, and then, you know, we, we have no social media until you're a certain age. I'm okay being the bad guy if it helps protect their mental health in high school. <laughs> you know, we have cell phone contracts where they understand, you know, if you have a phone, that does not mean you have free reign. And so we have the right to check those phones at any time. Um, right. You know, but the goal is always to help give them the tools that they need to have autonomy in this area. It's not for me to give them rules. It's to help them know how to handle a device that is designed to addict them that they have with them every wow. day um, I want them to be be able to be wise with that that is so good Jesse thank you so yes. much for being with us today on unscripted faith thank you so much for having me it's been it's been fun for sure up next what would you do if you were given the worst possible news you could ever receive would you choose to live in fear or would you choose to walk by faith? Find out what one woman chose and how it has made all the difference in her family's life. We'll be right back after this short break. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. You'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing deepen your relationship with him and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek him anew, rest your mind in his counsel and hear his wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness his word manifest in your life and return to his promises for you. Ask for Prophetic Reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Welcome back to Unscripted Faith. Our next guest, her faith is as strong as it has ever been, but it didn't come without its fair share of tests along the way. Katie Herman joins us now. Katie, you were told something by the doctors that no parent ever wants to hear. Take us to that moment. You know, it's interesting. I was actually told it twice. I think the second time was worse. Um, I was told in May of 23, last year, that my two and a half year old son, I have um, five kids, he's my fourth son. Um, I was told that he had leukemia and that did a number. Um, oh, yeah. I think the worst, what was worse than that was five, a year later on mother's day, five days before his last treatment, I was told he had relapsed and had cancer tumors behind his eyes. And, um, that was worse. <laughs> so yeah. there are a couple different moments, but, um, yeah, as far as, uh, faith that has been strengthened along the way, we've had, uh, multiple opportunities for endurance in this, in this road. Well, it's gotta be so difficult. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I see sometimes the television shows, you see like, like the, the Shriners and things like that, and you see the kids. I mean, how was walking through those treatments and did you battle with anger towards God? Because I mean, you're living for God, you're doing these things, and then to see this happen to your son, what was, what was in your thinking throughout that time? I love that question. And some people may think that I'm not answering honestly in this, but um, honestly, the Lord had brought us into a church community just a couple years prior to this happening that he prepared us, you know, he prepares us for things right. so that we're, so that we're girded. So we have the strength yes. that we need before we get into it. And 
when we got the first diagnosis, my mind had been so familiar with healing testimonies out of our church with just miraculous testimonies that honestly the word was was already in me that no weapon formed against us will prosper that we have the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and nothing will in any way harm us and um that doesn't negate the flush side i was i was angry at what we had to walk through um i was never angry at god i was just mad at the test but i would, was just so grateful in the last really two to four years the lord was just preparing us um, in such a gracious way that we had the word planted in our hearts, my husband and I did, and that didn't make it easy, but we never doubted, um, we never doubted the word and never doubted God's goodness to our son and to our family. So where are you now in this process with your son? Yeah, so he just passed his um, all clear. He did what was called, a, uh, we had to do a bone marrow transplant um, after he had the relapse behind his eyes, which they told us was very rare. Our hospital hadn't seen that in over four years, which is another thing you don't want to be told. Like yes. you have all the doctors scratching their heads. This never happens. I'm like, well, thank you. What else do you want to say? Um, so this summer we went through a bone marrow transplant. We were in the hospital for a month. Um, one of our sons, our six-year-old son was his bone marrow donor when um, had his surgery for his brother. And at hundred days post transplant, they recheck all the tests and everything just came back clear. Praise God. Thank that you, Jesus. Praise Thank God for you, that. Jesus. Uh, uh, yeah. Just real, uh, what is uh, um, the bone marrow transplant? What exactly happens with that? Because they take it out of your son and put it, uh, how does that work? Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so they tell you a lot of stuff that we did not agree with. Um, the doctors tell you things like we're going to, so they do a full body radi radiation two times a day for three days. So you had to stay fasting until he got sedated seven times in like a three or four day period because of all they needed to do. So they did full body radiation two times a day for three days and then a really high dose chemo. And they tell you all this ridiculous stuff in the natural of what's gonna happen to his body and the ramifications. And we just listened to them and we said, okay, well, none of that's happening. And, um, and so basically they just wipe out your entire immune system so that your body has no memory, almost like a newborn. And then they put our other son's bone marrow into his body to then what they call engraft. And it was just, it was such a hard month um, being in the hospital. He couldn't leave his little room. His siblings couldn't come see him, all this kind of stuff. But the things that God did were the doctors every day came in and said, we need to put in a feeding tube because this, this bad thing's going to happen where he's going to be throwing up his own esophagus and all of his mucus lining is going to get destroyed. And we just kept thinking, no, we have power and authority over every sickness and disease. And this stuff you're telling me sounds like a sickness or disease so that's not going to happen and after about 12 days the doctors finally gave up they kept saying oh you're going to need it you're going to need it and then finally they were like well i guess you don't need that feeding tube huh and we're like wow. i guess not Come on. praise god you know so we're trying to kind of not be snarky to them but just saying yeah we're here we're walking this out but um we don't have to do it the way that that the natural way the natural mind goes Wow, I mean, a mama in authority, <laughs> knowing who she is and declaring those things over her babies, it doesn't get much better, girl. You are there, walking this faith thing. Is there, there was declaring that was done, I will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine, I can only imagine what some of those on-call doctors saw in the midnight hour, you know? Well, I love- Well, and one of time my husband said, cause he wasn't trying to be snarky, but we were, oftentimes we took turns who was there, but this time we were both in the room. And he said, I'm just curious, this, this doctor was probably in his late sixties and you know, he's been around and my, my husband said, have you ever had a child that made it through without this mucositis was what they called it when you're gonna need a feeding tube and all this terrible stuff happens to you. And he just got, he kind of just was very serious. He said, I could count on my fingernails. He wouldn't even say fingers. He could count on his fingernails. And we were like, okay, thanks. And then he got to witness, didn't happen. Did anything happen? Praise God. Did That's anything? It. Now, what were the doctors saying about all this after you guys yes. came back when you said, I told you so? I mean, we, I just want Jesus to be revealed in us. That's I don't, right. you know, it's like, let, let the, let the Lord do whatever he is doing in each of their hearts. Cause everyone's going to receive it in different ways. Um, even we, so one of the, one of the negative effects of the tumor behind his eye is that he, um, has, it's, it's interesting. We're waiting to see the full healing, but he has blindness in his left eye that they told us would never come back. And we've, we've prayed over him and at times we've seen it come back and then it kind of goes away. So we're just like, all right, Lord, we know your promise for full restoration is coming. 
Um, but even then, there was one time I came in and he was he was seeing it out of his eye at that point. And I told the doctor, I said, I have great news for you. He can see. And she just she said, well, did you go to ophthalmology? It was like, who confirmed this? <laughs> I'm thinking, no, we prayed over him. Anyway, Come so on. sometimes they're they're just kind of this stunned of like, we don't really know what to do with that. Or when when I shared with one of his old doctors that he didn't have the mucositis while we were going through the month long in the hospital, she just made this face. Because I saw her, she we we had to get transferred to a whole new team once we he had the relapse, and so I saw one of our first doctors, and she said, "How's Silas?" And I said, "He's great." And she looked at me like, "You're lying. Like, what's wrong with you?" I'm like, "No, really. Let me tell you." So they all just kind of have a different response, but it's like just let them process, just let them see Jesus. It's not me. Don't look at me at what I'm doing. It's like just you'll you'll know him, you'll meet him. You'll see what he's doing. Did you the uh, the name Silas? Yes. I, I immediately I started going to Paul and Silas saying praises unto God at yes. midnight and everyone's bands were loose. I, obviously you probably didn't know that coming into it, but did that play any right. significance in this journey? Yeah. Well, that uh, the Brandon Lake song came out through the summer of uh, you know sing like Silas tearing down the prison walls and so that kind of became our our family oh, anthem so cool. of the kids you know blasting it at home as we you know just kind of sing and shout at home and singing it over Silas. So he um, he has a mark on his life. He has a story on his yes, life he that does. he doesn't even know the significance of, but he'll find out one day. Yes. And what a powerful testimony that your children get to walk through this with you. Not that you would have chose this for anybody to go through, but now right. this becomes the foundation of their faith, a miraculous healing God who stands with us and carries us through. We are so thankful for your testimony. You are such a gift, yeah. uh, a gift to this world, really. You really are. Thank you. I, our goal is just that the Lord would be seen in our lives. Like we're not just, just the concept of surrender. I feel like the Lord just keeps telling me we're not here even for the miracles and for the blessings. You know, when God told Moses, like you can go in the promised land, but I'm not going. And Moses said, if I don't have you, I don't want to go. I, I want your presence more than I want your promises. And so just part of this journey is just how do we yeah, I want the promises. I want the, all the benefits that come with the covenant, right, of, of healing and full restoration and all those things that we're told. But, but just realizing that if I carry the person and presence of Jesus, I want him to be manifest in my life more than I need my son to be fully healed. And, and being able to, and I, I believe that he wants that more than I even want it. So it's not saying I won't have it, but realizing that, that God being displayed and glorified through our lives is why we're here. We're just passing through so fast. And so um, there are still days that I feel sorry for myself. I don't want this to be our story. You know, I don't want, you know, I would have liked something else, yeah. but, but it's not about us, you know, and, um, and Paul and Silas knew it, right? That's how That's they could right. sing in the worst of circumstances. So Amen. that is my prayer. Like, Lord, just use this. This has been so uncomfortable, but like, just be seen and let other people be moved to know your goodness and your love. Well, I've heard it said that the chief end of man is the glory of God, and you guys have really personified that. So thank you for stopping by here on Unscripted yes. Faith and sharing your story. And may God continue to bless you, your family, and we pray total recovery over yes. Silas's life that he yes, will be a amen. sign and a wonder in yes. Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Well, it's now time for a new spirit walk as Tom takes us through the book of Acts. Let's take a look. As we read through the book of Acts, which is what we've been doing as we've been on this spirit walk, one thing you see is they're, they're outside all the time preaching the gospel. They're sharing it in the marketplaces and in the squares and in the synagogues. But that's not the whole story. Listen to what it says here in Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they went to people's houses. You know, I, I love, when I was growing up, my dad would have Bible studies in our house. He would invite friends that he worked with from the, the steel mill and from the, the neighborhood and various places and people from church. And we'd have a great time having these fellowship times around the Word of God from house to house. And I still love that. You probably love it too. You probably love when you're invited to someone's house. You go there for a meal. There's something intimate about that, very intimate. And in the Eastern cultures, you know, the Middle East, the cultures around Jerusalem where Israel was, to be invited over to somebody's house was an incredible honor and incredibly intimate. And as they went from house to house sharing the gospel, it made an even greater impact. 
And that's the key, intimate fellowship. See, we're not loners. We're not on an island somewhere serving Jesus. We're not walking alone. There's an old hymn that said, though none go with me, still I will follow. And yeah, we should have that level of commitment. But you know what? I need people to go alongside of me. I need my Christian family, my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we still get together. We have a Bible study we go to. There's other places, maybe prayer meetings. And there's great strength in that. I need that strength, and you need that strength too. You know, we are involved in Christian television here, and it's so important, but you've heard me say many times that it is not a substitute for church, and even Sunday morning is not a substitute for you having close fellowship. And, you know, Sunday, it's great. We're here in the Word of God. We're worshiping uh, collectively. It's wonderful. And then we all kind of get in our cars and go home. What about the fellowship time? What about the time around the table? So seek that out. If you don't have that, I'm sure your church has groups that that meet in homes, has prayer meetings, has fellowship meetings, meals that they do to get together. You know, I've been going to the same church for decades. And when you do that, when you've had long uh, attendance in one direction like that, it gives you the opportunity to build great relationships. And when difficult times come, You don't have to start from square one. You can go right to your brothers and sisters that you know, that have been to war with you, that have battled things out in prayer with you already, and you can pray for one another and strengthen one another. And I have to tell you, there's almost nothing that is better for your spirit walk. Well, I'm so glad that you've taken time out of your schedule to welcome us into your home. And I hope that you've been blessed by this because we've had some great conversations today. And I love, uh, Katie, take a look at what Tom just said there about how, you know, just the importance of the body and the fellowship and how God strategically placed her in a body of believers that were perfectly nurturing for her during the time. You know, I love that about God. He knows exactly what we need, when we need it. Sometimes he positions us and puts us in place ahead of time yes just to make sure we don't even know well, why are we going here why are we doing that and then you get there and you look back and you say daddy that's knows why. best that's exactly right yeah. i mean imagine that the sovereign god's ahead of us i mean yeah, <laughs> our yeah, life yeah. got started after he already finished it all right you know and i think about too jesse talking about the college campus and um that was such a critical time for me jay and without that body of believers there i think i would have felt very lost and so community is so important we can get so strong in ourselves and think oh i've got this it's just me and jesus but having others allows us to experience his fullness mm-hmm. in our lives. It does. And you know, you think about how many questions do you have at that yeah. age? Oh. You know, when you're in your early 20s, I mean, you're full of all sorts of questions and you're yes. wondering, okay, why is this happening? Whether she's had about boys and everything else, all these questions that you have. And when you're yes. in a body of believers, uh, I love it because the Bible says where two or more are gathered, yes. there he'd be in the midst. So the yes. moment that two people get together, God's wisdom, his presence, his anointing is available. Yeah. You know, it's like Katie with Silas and you bringing up Paul and Silas. Yeah. That's right. It was Paul and Silas together. Those shackles were That's broken. Right. Prison right. doors were swung wide. And everybody's bands were loose. Yes. Let's Amen. go. There is power in community. We pray that you have found a beautiful church community wherever you are and that this Cornerstone Television is also a community for you to be encouraged, spurred on, and filled with hope. Be back tomorrow. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.